and uh, we can get going. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. This is the last episode for this uh, organic uh, series. My name is Marianne. I'm the extension assistant for the Peace Country Beef and Forage Association. And um, Joanna, the host of this webinar, is working with um, one of our speakers to uh, figure the his internet internet connection so today we are uh, we are having two the, our producer panel and uh, so we have with us ken binks and ken binks uh let me know if i'm wrong well you'll introduce yourself but you are you are not organic but your son is organic right and you are in the sex myth area and we also have with us makai makai is in heinz creek and uh, he's been organic for three, four years, I believe. And he's also one of our director. Um, the webinar has, is sponsored by ProCert and OCIA. So thank you so much to them for helping us cover the cost of running the webinar. And um, uh, yeah, I think we are uh, ready to start. Um, maybe um, who wants to start? Ken Bings, Makai, are you? Who, who wants to, to, to open up? Um, Makai, do you want to start maybe with uh, your presentation? I can if you like, sure. Let me see if I remember how to bring up my presentation. Oh, that looks hopeful. <clears throat> okay. Is there a picture of a cute yes, kid that yeah, nobody believes is mine and a bunch of fields and stuff? Yeah, we see. It's perfect. Super. Uh, yeah, my name is Makai Ross. I uh, farm out at uh, Cleardale. Um, I farm there for as long as you want to put a number to it because I moved there when I was six years old. Um, uh, I would like to thank the PBFA for asking me to present today, although I'm afraid that uh, the reason they asked me is because I have so much experience, meaning I uh, know how not to do what I'm trying to do, um, not so much uh, success in trying to do what I'm doing. Um, and I also have to give a huge thank you to Jeannie Jeannie. She is the one who went through and did all the tech stuff for me. Um, so yeah, otherwise I just would have emailed Marianne or Joanna a dozen pictures and yeah, it would have been not near as nice. Anyway, um, I, uh, I don't have a whole bunch of bullet points and stuff like that. I was just going to kind of tell the story of what we've been doing so far. Um, as I said, we've, I've farmed with my folks for years. Um, back 14 13 years ago I've kind of lost track um we were uh conventional tillage um so we would take a piece of land we would plow it we would disc it yeah three four times um cultivate it as needed and it was um kind of standard summer follow um we did buy a land roller oh probably probably about 18 years ago um and a land roller really run over top of your plowing uh really smooths it out and significantly decreases the number of of cultivation afterwards although that was usually disking but you guys know what i mean uh yeah so that's what we used to do. Then, well, there you go, 13 years ago. Fall 2006, I attended a, um, the last reduced tillage linkages, I believe was the name of the, of the group um, that um, I don't want to say pioneered because no-till is, what, 40 years old? Um, but they were a big push uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s to drastically, in, dramatically, sorry, increase the percentage of farmers doing no-till in, it might have been more than Alberta, but 
for sure in Alberta. And yeah, I went to that conference. And although I'd already heard of no-till, I was convinced, absolutely. I don't want to plow anymore. I don't want to disc anymore. I don't want to cultivate anymore. So I bought a no-till drill, which looks pretty similar to the one in the picture. Mine has, um, is my cursor visible there by John Deere? Somebody give me a thumbs yes, up. Yes, it is. Super, yes. thank you. Okay. okay, so this is, as near as I can tell, very similar to my drill. Uh, this rear box um, does have, on mine at least, has a division in it, so you can apply, uh, so 60% of the, uh, yeah, 60% of the capacity of this box uh, would be seed and 40% fertilizer, and and so you can put some fertilizer with your, with like in row, um, or you can make it 90, well, I don't know, 95% seed if, if you so choose the, the door, the divider door is movable. Uh, my box also has an identical, almost identical box right up on the very, like this front edge of the frame. So there's a walking space between the two boxes. And, and yeah, so pretend that this box is right up here, right along the edge. Uh, so that front box is a dedicated fertilizer box and on on my drill and it has um, a dozen openers um, on this front um, rock shaft uh, which allows you to mid row band in fertilizer um, and mine also has in between the two boxes i don't remember whether it's mounted on the seed box i think it's mounted on the seed box is a little tiny um, grass seed attachment which allows you to put in uh, two and a half or maybe three bags of, of grass seed. Um, and then there's tubes come down that you can either leave them hang and they'll just broadcast directly down, or you can actually like poke them in these little uh, seed boot or uh, yeah, seed boot for lack of a better word, that's not the right word, um, so that your grass seed can actually go right down and go right in with your your larger seed in your seed box or whatever the case is anyway so fantastic machine um mine came with the style of of uh, implement tires um i don't know if i touch on it later oh speaking of which before i get any further i will try to remember to pause occasionally that is not for dramatic effect that's so that uh, if anybody has a question just pipe up because um my only rule about questions is there are no silly questions except for the ones you don't ask. That's a silly question. You didn't ask it. Anyway. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah. And there's like a raise hand function or something. Anyway. Um, so yeah, mine had these round implement tires on it. Um, there's two identical ones at the back. Uh, one of them is the ground drive for the, um, this right over here is the clutching system. But uh, when it was wet, I had issues with these uh, round implement tires giving me ruts. And on hard dry ground, after you put down pressure on this, this the, the seed boots, well, especially fertilizer, so there's actually three gangs on mine, it would significant, it would lift the back of the machine enough so that you wouldn't get proper uh, ground drive tire action so yeah i seeded for like half a day and only burnt up two tanks of seed instead of eight or whatever it was that was a disaster anyway we ended up putting on just a like a vehicle flat square muddy type tready tire on it and that gave a whole bunch of flotation and it gave enough literally friction on that ground drive wheel to cure any issues that way. Any questions about the machine before I go on? Other than I love it, I'll play that too. Yeah, it's some, sorry guys, something I haven't mentioned. So you do have uh, the option to uh, enter, to type in a question at Q&A and you do have a, yeah, please feel free to, feel free to raise hands if uh, you have any questions. Um, so yeah, we, 
did the typical uh, conventional no-till, uh, fall burn, seed, uh, pre-emergent burn. Um, hopefully it was after seeding because it's usually too wet and you end up with ruts to do it before seeding. But there were issues that became evident fairly quickly. This is a, a pasture field that had a lot of, um, it had some thistle in it, um, little like two foot ones, nothing too exciting. The thistles were a couple meters apart, um, but it had a lot of um, rose bushes in it. So I rented a roto wiper, which is uh, basically a piece of pipe, a piece of carpet on it, uh, spray nozzle, spray chemical onto it. When you're driving down the field, that piece of pipe, which is horizontal, rotates backwards and so it licks the bottom of the leaves of the plant and applies the chemical. Um, it's not fast, doesn't use anything for chemical. I was using um, a tenth of a liter per acre of grazon on this field. Um, I had to double pass it to actually get, uh, you kind of had to hit the rose bushes from both sides of the plant in order to not just set them back, to actually terminate them. Uh, but anyways, the first time I did it, I used Roundup because that's what was recommended. And I parked the machine and it siphoned dripped all night. So this picture, oh, there we go. So this picture on the left with the blue box thing around it, um, yeah, it's about four years old. This mark was made in 2009. The picture on the right, um, I hope that the two pictures means that I'm improving my management because as you can see, there's a lot more grass, there's less, you know, you can, there's less soil visible. This is my track, truck route to the bottom. But anyways, um, it is slowly getting smaller, uh, but this picture with the red square on it was taken this summer. So that is a solid 10 years of this dead spot. Uh, we ended up doing mid-season herbicides uh, because stuff just wanted to grow in our no-till. Um, foxtail barley, which is a big deal. Um, yeah, sprayer tracks, right, and I talked about the vehicle tire track. This, just a quick question, Matt, yep. at this point. Someone is asking, how wide is your drill? Uh, not wide enough. <laughs> um, it's 15 feet. Um, and it's a seven and a half inch spacing. Um, when I, I, we don't do very many acres, I think the max acres we've done in a year, um, well, even prior to getting this drill, when we were conventional, dead had a 20 foot, um, you know, typical press drill. Um, yeah, this machine's 15 feet. Our typical acres is only like three to four hundred a year, um, which is really easy. The fact that you can do mid row band fertilizer, um, your small seed attachment, so you can underseed or whatever, um, of course, and the option of being able to put fertilizer in row. Um, I mean, you're doing four jobs at once. Uh, so yeah, 15 feet seems really small, but you know, every spring I talk to a buddy of mine that has a 30 foot machine and he does a minimum of two passes, once for seed and once for fertilizer because it's a single shoot machine. And guess what? It takes him the exact same number of hours to do a hundred acres as it does me. But yeah, it's 15 feet. Um, it's yeah. Okay. So then on my next picture here. This is, I don't have a starting date for this, but I'll bring up the, as far as I know, um, I did transfer the data as to when these pictures were taken off of my phone, but it didn't want to come up when I got them on the computer. And so I'm, I'm guessing that the picture on the left is an older picture. Um, I'm standing on a fence post. This is facing north. This fence along the left-hand side is facing north. 
And this is where our custom sprayer stopped and, I don't know, shot out a little extra chemical. And then you can see on the right hand page, the same, same mark. Um, and like I say, I need to go through my phone. It's been there four or five years for sure. And there's actually another mark. Um, I have other pictures where I'm facing, instead of facing north, like in this picture, I'm facing east. Well, it's the exact same. I'm literally standing on top of the brace in the corner of mom and dad's fence. Um, there's another mark, but it's like this one's pretty easy to see. The other one, even with a box around it, you'd be like, huh, what is that? Uh, so yeah, not crazy about some of the downsides of conventional um, no-till. But going back to plowing and ending up with something like this in, this is our field. Uh, for anybody who drives the highway north of Teepee Creek, you know exactly where this is because it's been there every year for I don't know how many years. This is a wind erosion off of a, uh, we're facing north, so there's a field over here on the west side that gets plowed almost every fall. And of course, in our country, the wind goes the direction of the arrow, which is west to east. And this ditch, which is mostly snow, has a lot of his topsoil in it. And this brown black out here is also. So his neighbor, I'm sure, is happy, but yeah. So I wasn't interested in that. Even though, you know, the soil health part and um, increased interest in organic production. Um, yeah, I mean, I was fascinated by all that, but it just, uh, how do you do organic without plowing? So I stumbled across this book and I honestly do not have a clue or remember where, I, how I heard about it. I had to order it on Amazon because of course you can't, well, maybe now you can get it from the library, uh, but in 14 or 15 when I found it, um, yeah, you had to buy it, which I don't regret. Uh, yeah, it's by Jeff Moyer of the Rodale Institute. Um, They've been working on organic no-till farming for like 30 years down the Rodale. But that's in Pennsylvania and things are quite a bit different up here. And it's not really no-till because you still have to plow. But we'll get to that. So in 2016, we, Jimmy, Jimmy and I, uh, we certified our, our farm. Um, some of it was easy because it had just been in pasture. Um, and we hadn't hadn't done anything to it. Um, the roto wiping weed control I mentioned earlier was the last of it was done in 2011, um, and not on any of the fields that we could certify that year. Uh, there was a couple of fields we had to put into transition, uh, which takes 36 months, and that's uh, what is it? July 15th, July 15th. Ken, give me a thumbs up if I'm right on that, it's something like that. Um, anyway, so we did our transition and um, according to the piece of paper we have, our, our pastures um, are still conventional because uh, uh, there's no, no organic cattle around. Um, so there's kind of no advantage to registering them. Um, but if I wanted to, for some reason in the future, I would sign a five year prior land use affidavit and 12 months after ProCert or OSHA or whoever the certifying body was, was happy. Um, 12 months later, I could put organic animals out there and away we'd go. Okay, so back to plowing so this is a plowed field that's been rolled um you can kind of tell that you know all the lumps are or the the plowing looks really good because it's been rolled um one thing i really like about this picture and and i realize it's hard to see um this white that i'm following with my cursor that is a 
well, you'd have no idea unless you plowed it. That's actually a water run, which in Clearedale is shocking because there's, I don't know, feet per half mile of drop. Anyways, there were eight obviously different colors of soil in this field after I plowed it. So I'm not a huge proponent of um, soil tests. I mean, I understand the advantages of them, um, but it wouldn't matter how many holes you put in this field. I mean, I can walk out there and tell you there's eight different eight different types of soil. So the results would be, yeah, maybe kind of an average, but yeah. Anyway, uh, here's just a picture of, of the land roller. We have uh, nothing fancy. Uh, this picture is actually uh, me land rolling some subsoiling uh, that was done on a demo on the edge of one of our pastures a few years ago. And actually, PCBFA has a, has a write-up on it. Um, let's see, it would be in the 18 annual report, I believe. Anyway, it was an interesting experiment. Um, yeah, so... I, I actually hired this plowed. Um, I rolled it. As you can see here, it's kind of flat. I went over it once, cutting in, I don't know, maybe two inches with kind of a medium weight disc. Uh, and then I harrowed it. I think I harrowed it twice. Um, and then I seeded it to a fancy and not nearly cheap enough 16 way cover crop. Um, and I went to look for the list of what was in that because I knew somebody would ask, but um, my list is out at the farm. Um, I know it had things like hairy vetch and tillage radish, and it had a bunch of oats, you know, kind of to, to give it volume. Um, I didn't ask Akeem, so I foolishly put um, iron and clay, no, what is it, cowpea, iron and clay cowpea, anyways, into the mix, and, and it doesn't even grow, so I don't know why they sell it, but anyway, um, let me think if I can think of anything else I'd put in there. I think I put buckwheat in. Anyways, unfortunately, it didn't hardly grow at all. Um, when I say that I had five plants per square meter, I mean, there was one on each corner of the square meter and one in the center, and that's it. And they grew about, well, six to 16 inches tall. Nothing happened. But I had, and I don't know why I don't have any pictures of it, I had um, good fungal growth in this field. Um, I had puffballs that you could see, thanks to the lack of plants, for 100 yards, I had softball. Um, there was one might have been even volleyball size. It was huge. I actually went out and, I, like I said, I don't know why I don't have a picture of it. I actually went out because I, I thought some garbage had blown across my field or something because it was massive. But anyway, so that was that was my uh, unfortunate expensive cover crop <laughs> for you. And I haven't uh, haven't done much in cover crops since um but this summer i'm going to try it again uh in a more serious fashion okay so this is the same field um we're probably not far from that other picture location well we're facing straight east here instead of uh northeast um from that other picture this is straight in the gate um I'm trying to remember buddy of mine phoned me on may the 9th and said, oh, you should go check your field. It might be ready to seed. And of course, I looked across the road at my neighbor's um, fields and they were black, as in wet, <laughs> black. <laughs> and no, no, no. He said, oh yeah, you should go check it. So I come down here and I could have been seeding this on the 9th of May. So this is, yeah, spring of 17. So by the 11th, I finally had all my ducks in a row and I pulled into the field. And this, 
Well, you can see there's this line here where everything's nice and yellow to the right, and there's this short distance of not much, and everything's nice and green off to the left. So this mess here in the center, that is where I started with my drill in the ground, planting my peas, and I was broadcasting a alfalfa and ice alsec mix uh, on top as I went. The reason there is no peas right here, there's green ones in this foreground, but the reason there's this long streak that disappears down the picture is because I put about four inches of peas in the bottom of my drill box before I put the inoculant in. So by the time I got about halfway down the field, the inoculant had shaken down. We're talking like that brown peat inoculant. It had shaken down to where it was interacting with peas. And yeah, by the time I came back, which is this first nice yellow stripe here, it was putting out the inoculant the way it should be. So that was a good lesson to learn. I mean, I already knew I needed inoculant, but I didn't know I needed it that bad. So this yellow off to the right, I see that all on the 11th and then it started raining at, well, I literally drove off the field as soon as it started to rain and it rained for three days or four days and I didn't get back on the field till the 24th of May, which is why there's the two different colors. It's because I finished seeding the field and this foreground is green because this is my, my headland path. Uh, yeah, I put in uh, two and a half bushels an acre about through the seed box and one and a half bushels per acre through the fertilizer box because I wanted to minimize my row spacing to try to get my peas to canopy over uh, the ground and cut down on weed pressure. Um, and yeah, it worked good. I uh, have done that ever every uh, organic field since. Um, oh, I didn't, I think there's a picture later on that shows me doing it, but I don't know why I didn't put it here. So when this field, well this, this yellow peas that you can see here that are more mature, when they were up about two inches, I had eight inch tall, um, meadow brome and a couple other plants um, just growing like crazy any imperfections in the in the plowing um, so anyways i grabbed my little seven foot finishing mower that we use around the yard and i did this 17 acres with a, a noisy open cab tractor uh, i must be getting well, i already have the lazy part down but i must be getting old and irritable because that drove me nuts. But anyways, so I mowed this, I think it's 17 acres. I mowed this um, basically short enough that I might've hit the odd, you know, pea that was sticking out because it was two and a half inches tall instead of two. Uh, but I chewed those meadow brome uh, tufts down. And that was actually really excellent weed control. Um, all those metal brome tufts did was shoot up a seed head and that was it. They didn't do a single thing the rest of the year. So of course the peas come up, canopy over those short little runty tufts, the seed heads were up, that's no big deal. Um, because of the time difference between the two parts of the field, I realized it was a success. So I, this, this greener area, which there's another one to the south. I did all that with a rented 15 foot mower in the air conditioned tractor with radio, and that was a lot better. Um, and but same result, it uh, it knocked the tops off all the plants that I didn't want, and you couldn't tell the peas grew great. Um, so yeah, a mower is uh, is an interesting tool to have. Um, I would almost say a need have with um, with organic. Um, agriculture, uh, Ken and Mark can comment that on on how they feel on those uh, on that piece of equipment for uh, for usage. Uh, I think also flail mower, which is a uh, might have its advantages as well. Um, anyway, yeah, I got 32 bushels average off this field. Um, if I'd have got it all seeded when this yellow part was done, uh, it might have been 42. There was the that 
uh, 13 days that I lost in May, um, not getting it seeded early was unbelievable. But uh, everybody listening already knows that uh, seed timing is is as important as the half inch of rain after the day after you're done seeding. Anyways, um, any questions on that before we keep going? I think we'll keep going there. Okay. Um, so I got talked into doing plowing late in the fall. Um, but I didn't have much luck with it. Um, I couldn't get, yeah, the plowing got done. Um, and I rolled it, which of course doesn't take long at 30 feet at whatever speed that, uh, you know, you can do it at. But I didn't get my disc and heroin done in the fall of 17. And um, I don't think I did any plowing in 18, uh, 19, which was last fall, of course. Same thing. Um, I, yeah, between, you know, a couple hours, an hour a day that I didn't work and a couple of breakdowns, I might have been able to get the disc and heroin done. But anyway wasn't yeah i don't think that's the way to go plus you want your mycorrhizal fungi uh etc to have that three to four months of cover crops after doing your your plowing um to help not just reinvigorate your soil but also to get that mycorrhizal fungi back into normal production so that then the next spring it's there when you plant your cash crop so in 18, I grew um, uh, forage oats and uh, peas with them, you know, good intercrop. Um, as I said, so this would be, I had to disc and harrow in the spring of 18 because I didn't get it done in 17. So that delayed everything. Um, there was advantages to growing the two crops together. Uh, the peas stood up really nice and tall when I swathed them. Uh, I swathed like eight or nine inches off the ground because the peas were standing up so nice uh, that there was no pods lower than that. Um, of course, I had to swath it at that because the peas were ready to start popping and the oats was nowhere near mature. Uh, yeah, I seeded it at uh, four bushels an acre uh, through my seed um box for the oats and two bushels an acre through the the fertilizer box for the peas uh, about a 25 to 30 percent of that field drowned out so to speak so the peas didn't survive in that chunk but the oats did so you know intercropping for the wind there um but then i put it in the bin and i couldn't sell it so I had to pay to get it separated, which wasn't too expensive. I don't remember, I think it cost me 40 cents a bushel to separate it, uh, but I spent three days and plus 35 heat watching the separator run. And so that wasn't much fun. And then I still couldn't sell it because there's no market for uh, organic forage oats or feed oats um, to speak of unless you live south of Edmonton or maybe south of Calgary. So it went for feed to my father. Uh, the two bushels per acre of, of peas only yielded 10 bushels an acre. So yeah, I've got 800 bushels of organic peas and it's pretty hard to get rid of a half D train load of peas. So they're gonna be seed in the future, but no cash flow. Uh, the reason I have this picture up, this actually isn't the field that I'm talking about. Uh, the reason I have this picture up is, oh yeah, there we go. This is our uh, conventional field back in 13. Uh, for those of you who remember in 12, everybody had amazing bumper crops on the left-hand side of this field, of this line, sorry. Uh, this field was in a forage oats, I believe called Athabasca, because uh, of course feeding cows, it doesn't matter whether it's forage oats or not, but it produced about two inches of straw. We didn't bail, we, didn't, we just run it through the, the uh, 
straw chopper, blew it out the back of the combine. It put down an easy two inches of oat straw. So the spring of 13, I went out there days before anybody else was even looking at their fields because my tractor and my seed drill would drive on top of that oat straw. I put in peas on this field and we never did a spring burn. We did no midsummer um, herbicide. Uh, I don't remember if we did a fall after the peas, but anyways, had a great pea crop. And for those of you who remember, 13 was a dry year. Well, on two inches of oat straw, if you get a tenth of an inch of rain, it goes down to the ground and is insulated. So this really encouraged me on the organic, you got to have a mulch layer, um, you know, aspect. The reason there's a line in the centers is on the right hand side. You can see there's some bare ground. Um, the straw is pretty thin. The reason that is is because this was uh, where we grew super oats. And for those of you that know, um, super oats doesn't really produce any leaf. Um, the stalk is two thirds the height of normal oats. It looks terrible until you're combining it, and then the combine says, "Yeah, this is good stuff." Uh, the yields the yields pretty comparable to, to any other kind of uh, oats, but it does not leave the straw down. Um, because of the year was an issue, but you can see fairly clearly in this picture the differences um, um, uh, the difference that straw can can make as far as ground cover. Uh, let's see. So in 2019, um, I seeded flax into my oat pea field uh, that I that I'd inter intercropped in, in 18. Um, unfortunately, there just wasn't enough. Uh, mulch left over from the well of course we all know pea straw pretty much disappears when you run it through the combine uh, the oat straw other than where the swaths had been um, of course there's more straw there and there's, there's the chaff comes out of the combine and drops there um, there was some flax grew uh, but not enough to even I actually ended up grazing a good portion of that field uh, there wasn't enough there to do anything with it. Um, but anyway, that, to be honest, I don't even think this picture is of that field. I think this is one of my pasture fields, but I wanted to have a picture with it. There was a question, my guy sure. here. Um, have you tried backgrounding calves or wintering cows on the swath grazed old P mix? No, I have not. I have experience with um swath grazing on oats um you know make sure you swath it at the right time the what is it mid milk early milk um I, I don't remember off the top of my head um i think they would do amazing on it uh because there's benefits to have the peas in the diet as opposed to just straight oats um i have one year about 10 years ago i had a pea crop that in i want to say in july uh developed a, a root fungus and was literally dying from the, the bottom up and we got on the phone and we got a couple of neighbors um and with a couple of balers and the neighbor with the bale wrapper and another neighbor with the tractor to get bales to the, the wrapper. And we silaged that field, uh, which of course everybody thought we were nuts because we were doing this in, I don't think it was mid July or end of July. Um, yeah, we, we chewed up and baled a, a beautiful, what looked like a beautiful field of peas unless you walked out there and the, it was literally yeah, every day that brown starting at the dirt was going farther and farther up the plant. Um, yeah, we had 130 head and we fed them the pea bales. Um, 
they were out there until I want to say about the end of January. So October, November, December, January, we've got four months of, of uh, eating out of that. And we allowed them free access to the field as well. And they went out and licked snow and wandered around and I don't know they found some of the weeds that had grown after we silaged and so yeah I would I would not hesitate for a moment to grow uh, peas and oats together and and swath graze it um, it'll definitely work when you have to swath it that is a question for Akeem or or someone in of his uh, caliber um, but yeah no I wouldn't hesitate to do it for a second. Uh, even though I haven't, uh, yeah, absolutely, you could do that. Awesome. Um, I think, Mackay, I see we're uh, creeping along for time, so I think if uh, it's all right with you, we'll go and let uh, Ken go next. And uh, if we've got time at the end, we'll let you finish up, if that's all right. Sure. Good day, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Very good. Well, I don't have a lot of pictures. Uh, apparently, the the camera that or the phone that had all the pictures on it was lost last fall during harvest, and we thought we would recover it this spring, and we didn't. So those pictures are gone, I guess. Uh, howsoever, um, just want to explain our history a little bit. We uh, we are a pioneer farm family in in the peace country. Our, Great grand, my great grandfather came here on the Edson Trail, if anyone's familiar with that, in 1912. <clears throat> basically settled east of Grand Prairie, and my family still all are all there, actively farming. And uh, I actually moved a little bit further away to Teepee Creek, which is where my mother was raised, so it wasn't foreign country to me either. So my family lives in Teepee Creek, so. Um, we're still close family. We predominantly work together and everything's good. So over the years, we have sort of always tended to lean toward the beef industry. Uh, our families had cattle as long as I can remember, and it's just something that we have kind of leaned towards. Uh, we have grain farms for many years. I was raised farming grain, so we have those those backgrounds or those roots. So uh, my youngest son decided to go farming in roughly 2015. Decided that might be a good uh, avenue to go. We were currently farming too. And, and uh, so he decided to go organic. And so he certified all the property that he actually bought himself uh, organic. And uh, we were virtually growing our crops organically anyways so it wasn't a big stretch because you know we were basically plowing down existing hayland and growing a few crops of oats and and turning it back to grassland so organic thing just seemed a natural progression and and we actually believe in it as well we we don't just do it because it's convenient we do it because we actually believe in it we we uh, believe that that uh, some of the agriculture practices may not be sustainable. And I do believe from the research that I've done that some of our methods are actually degrading our soils to the point where they may quit producing. So anyways, we, uh, we believe in it and, and that's why we're doing it. So currently we have about 800 acres of, of land that, that's dedicated to organic production. Um, and we also have, uh, my son actually has a small herd of cattle that's certified organic. So those cattle all stay on that particular property. And uh, he actually runs a few hogs that are organically, uh, they're on organic property and they're fed organically. So they are actually certified and he pays the fees to, to justify that. Uh, we haven't explored a very big market for that yet. We are actually uh, doing that now. There's been some interest in us maybe 
to find some organic feeder cattle or finished grass-fed beef. Uh, we're working on that, but right now, really, other than direct marketing, our livestock part of it is just on the conventional market. Uh, our grain part of it, uh, we continue to grow oats. I've added peas to the operation to get a few more crops uh, uh, before we put it back to grass. And was working very well. The peas, uh, we, we, we didn't know anything about growing peas, but we, we did soon learn that peas are a funny crop. They, they don't take a lot of competition, but if you get them in early and get them growing, um, the competition, they seem to do their thing early enough that the competition actually enhances them. It holds them up, it does a bunch of things. So the grass, as long as you can get the pea started and get it going good and get the, you know, get it three weeks ahead of the grass, um, they seem to do well and are a lot easier to harvest with the second crop in there. And so we, we've been swathing them and, and getting away with that and it's been working. And we're, then we're able to follow up with another oat crop because we've added some nutrition to the soil and some soil health. So that's predominantly we were, what we're doing at this point. So we are currently trying to reduce our tillage. Uh, and it was always my belief that plowing without a bunch of follow-up tillage should actually be the most um, innovative uh, practice and so uh, we have chose to only spring plow we, we have fall plowed of course the soil lays bare all winter freezes harder probably harder on the microorganisms within the soil so we have chosen now to to when we plow our grasses back and go into grain production. We do it in the spring, and we are very, 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 very fussy about how that's done. Uh, we hire a guy with a, a rollover plow. Uh, we've worked together over the last few years to learn how to plow properly. Uh, we plow with the intentions of direct seeding into that plow. So, of course, we we roll it or we harrow pack it, but that is as much tillage as we ever want to do. So uh, with our plowing, we're very fussy about making sure that there's no sod showing, and we're very fussy about not bringing the sod back up, because as soon as, what we find, as soon as the sod is exposed, now we have a chimney for our moisture to vanish. And so we don't want that. We want to get that sealed as quick as possible. So, you know, we get it plowed and seeded predominantly in the same week. And, uh, and we were very anal about that, I guess is the, the word. And so, yeah, it's still a bit rough. A lot of times we straight combine the, the oats. We generally do the first crop with oats. Uh, generally plow it east and west if we can. So that the next year when we seed it to peas, um, we can swath it if we want to. We can go with the swathing and not fight the, the odd hole or whatever that's still there. But, uh, you know, before we were more conscious about tilling, there was, we used to go into the, we did the same method. But in the fall of the year, we would go in there and fall work it with the narrow spikes and just spike that field. And we didn't have any, like all the organic matter was decomposed by doing that. So, you know, I remember years ago, we used to get in there and disc it all up and rip it all up right after we plowed it. And those big clods of sod would dry up and they'd be there five years later. So you got to get them covered with dirt, keep dirt on them and they just disappear. So and that's all must be good for the soil health. So that's pretty much what we're doing. Our, our yields are not bad uh, we don't we feel it's kind of a crop failure on our oats if we don't get 100 uh, we feel it's a crop failure on our peas if we don't get 40 uh, and 
traditionally we're not having we're, we're getting that uh, last year we we got caught like everybody else so we did get our oats off straight combines but we couldn't get our peas off so uh, the deer had a field day <laughs> last year so uh, that's pretty much our operation it's still heavily uh, still heavily uh, in the livestock business that's kind of a, a forgiving thing if we screw up we always get the cattle to back us up and and fix the screw ups uh, you know, we predominantly graze all our all our land in the fall uh, clean it up uh, we're practicing some uh, chaff saving we do have an old combine here with a chaff saver on it and we're we're swath grazing some of that and uh, we definitely swath graze our mistakes <laughs> and uh, so that uh, we have tried some direct seeding and mostly just into sod uh and i've had some very very uh i've had some success and some failures uh last year with all the moisture it was an absolute failure i i was convinced that it was absolutely the best thing we could have done last spring and it all germinated and the only thing that really come good was the grasses and I think because the extra moisture it just gave those grasses they laid up and they got ahead of our crop and took it out so the only thing in my cover crop mixture that survived was uh, 4010 peas for some reason they were able to compete with the grasses uh, the oats and turnips and hairy vetch, uh, even the hairy vetch did not amount to much, which is surprising because I've grown a lot of it over the years and it seems like a pretty good plant. But last year and the stuff we did there, it didn't, uh, it didn't do well. Some of the other stuff with a little bit more tillage and a little less competition did really well. We had, we had another field that we actually worked and seeded it to our cover crops and, and they did well. So... It was just setting that grass back that that caused us the grief and and i i think that's our own setback to uh, organically no-tilling is to control the quack grass uh, we have a lot of quack grass and i just don't know how to to control that because it thatch doesn't bother it and neither does uh, neither does uh, any other kind of organic texturing but uh, that's, that's pretty much what our operation is about uh um i don't know if, if you have any questions we certainly could answer them uh, uh that's about it <laughs> awesome uh, i don't see any questions yet but while they're uh while people are thinking about it we'll maybe get uh mark to give his uh his talk and then we'll uh, go from there. Yeah, I'm unmuted looks like, eh? You are. Okay. I don't have any pictures or anything here, so I'll try and be quick. Actually, the quickest thing I could say is I'll just echo almost everything what Ken said. Uh, ourselves, we certified our first field organic in 2013 and since uh, proceeded to have the, our entire land base certified. We started with organic oats, milling oats, and that has been a pretty good solid market for us. Beef has been our main game historically, so to transition to organics was fairly basic. Um, we didn't have many practices that we had to modify to to qualify for certification so we were actually able to do it once we decided to do it we were able to certify and produce an organic crop the following year just because we had good solid history on the fields um again like i said echoing what ken just said we're also beef is our main game and when our grass stands get tired we go in with a plow and then we Traditionally, have done two years in oats, but since uh, we try to go with spring plow, again, we try to minimize our passes. We pull a roller immediately behind the plow, and then twice two passes with the land leveler, and we can go into it with the hole opener without dragging sods up all over the field. 
we have done that with peas and works good until you get a super wet year like we've had the last two and the grasses have just been aerated when you plow them and they come back pretty strong so we have the challenge again of what to do with our holder grasses at bay to, so we can get the two two grain crops or possibly more in but being a beef producer we don't mind having the grass come either so we seed our peas we follow that with an oat crop and sometimes two but typically we will have a perennial hay stand alfalfa clovers grass seed under seeded with that oat crop and then uh, it's back into cow feed for a number of years in terms of trying to minimize our tillage practices we have taken done some direct seeding into sod with less than stellar stellar results um, two years we have tried we could use a flex coil 5000 with hole openers and we went straight into pasture uh, last year i thought well in july we had all our rain and should do a good job but we still left beaver huts all over the field and made a pretty big mess and what surprised me the most the most out of both those experiments was that we had the peas did the best of everything. They weren't, and we were just looking at a feed crop and see what we could do. And it was, a, it was a blend of peas and oats. We had some hairy vetch and some turnips and radish, but the grass wasn't killed at all. So the, it came as well with moisture, even though we'd graze it well prior. And then, but the peas came up and made for some pretty nice feed mixed in with the grasses. We had a neighbor come in and accidentally do a spray, kill one of our fields. So that went out of organic production in 20, 28 spring, July, 2018 that occurred. So we've got another year before it can go back into organic production. So there was an alfalfa stand and we said, well, we can use this as an experiment since everyone says you have to kill out your grasses before you direct seed. So we rented a disc drill, zero till disc drill. And we went into that with fall rye in the fall of 18. And I believe we seeded a little too late. It was into July and then we had some snow. So it did, it did germinate. We could see seed rows last spring, but it fell apart and didn't turn into anything. So we ended up going back in there with our flex coil with the hole openers and we drilled some oats peas into it again this year just to or in 2019 to try and get some growth back in there and it looks like we're just going to work it this year because our winter clay soil to zero tilled it doesn't look very promising except what Mackay touched on I believe in order to make it work we need a lot of thatch so what we've done on a different field is we have done two years of peas back to back. So we, we plowed it in 2017 spring, we put it into peas and then we harvested peas again last year off that field. It was a beautiful stand. I had lots of peas shoulder height, but we only pulled off about 15 bushel an acre. And looking at it, the soil tests last fall confirmed my suspicion. We had depleted what FOSS was there. And the belief is that we had, well, we had 10 pods, 10, 12 pods on a plant, but we only had two to three seeds in each pod. So, however, the soil test also told us we have 55 pounds residual nitrogen and that field is unworked. So we still have the balance of the straw and the trash to add to that. And our plan is to put that into a oat pea, uh, probably brassica mix this spring will be late spring after our critical crops are seeded uh, with and we're going to put some fall rye with it as well plan is to swath graze that field and then if we don't winter kill our fall rye we will let that come and 
we are going to attempt to roll it down and then direct seed a crop into it probably late June, mid June by the time it flowers. So it's not likely going to be a crop we can harvest other than a feed crop. So the PP, the P combination following the plowing back to back was pretty impressive on the growth as well as it's been showing the best soil test results. So we're gonna look at following when we take a grass stand out of production, put it into a feed crop instead of a second crop of peas and then possibly follow that with oats. The goal is if we can achieve a heavy enough straw stand that we can drill directly into that with a disc drill, then the goal is we can zero till. I believe the, I think I already said the, the critical thing to zero till or minimum till will be maintain trash to, to thatch cover on the surface to smother weeds, but Ultimately, our grasses, I'm sure, are going to poke through it. So I don't know if we're going to get more than one, maybe two years at best, before we're going to go back to tillage. However, we should be able to minimize our tillage even in that year following this goal. So that's um, basically a thumbnail sketch of what we're doing. Nothing too crazy or wild. I think that pretty much covers what I've got. Awesome. Thank you, you guys. Uh, if you guys, if anybody, any attendees have any questions, uh, can raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can talk directly to these guys or you can uh, ask it in the Q&A text box. Um, thank you all for uh, attending. I'll say that while we see if there's any questions. Um, we have, uh, this was but a bit of an experiment, but it's been, I think, fairly successful, so. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, wondering for Mark, uh, not sure if you answered this, but do you have a solution for the FOSS deficiency? Do not. Uh, um, we, we're, it's our cover crop this year. Uh, my goal is more for organic matter is and from what i'm seeing listen to all the experts if we get our organic matter going then we can have our biology going and that will in time take care of itself being a beef producer i'm not real concerned about getting it next year so long as i got feed for the cows and in time i believe that will come around uh, christine jones having listened to her several times she has said that there is, they have found very few soils across the planet that if we have things working right, won't supply, that they are capable to supply the needs of the plant that is growing. So that, that is our goal. Awesome. Uh, have any of you uh, tried seeding a mix of annuals, biennials, and perennials in the same seeding pass or in the same spring? Well, when we seed down our hayland, that's our annual and our biannual. So usually, typically, it's small seeds, so we'll make a separate pass to do that. So that's my experience. Uh, <clears throat> Ken here. I've actually, well, I've seeded annuals into pre-annuals and used grazing as, as the... Uh, herbicide if you will uh, with some success but to be honest with you I actually find better results if it's a bit dry than if it's wet and that seems interesting I always chose not to do it when it was dry sometimes but when I did actually do it I think I had better results and I think it's because the grass is is set back more and doesn't get ahead of the annuals Right. Makai, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, yeah, we've done uh, 
we've done seeding um, perennials and and uh, annuals in the same shot. Um, I mean, that was standard to go from from crop to uh, hay production um, before uh, becoming organic. Um, and since then, of course, I'm doing it to have those perennials be the the uh, green manure for the next rotation. Um, we seeded quite a few in the past, uh, annuals and um, sweet clover, which of course is a biannual. Um, but I don't know, we, we never had much luck actually getting to harvest that sweet clover, you know, the, well, year and a half later. Um, but, and the seed's not cheap. So you do that a few times and, and you kind of lose faith, but, um, as, as it certainly is worth trying it's, and, and it does, it does work. Uh, as far as the first year is concerned, um, but there's no guarantees. I mean, we over the years, Dad and I have seed seeded, you know, thousands of acres of oats under seeded to clover and timothy, or uh, barley under seeded to clover and timothy. Um, and yeah, we've still had years where the next, you know, after you're done combining, you look around the field and go, well, this doesn't look good, and you have to have to either, you know, when we were tillage, you'd have to work it, or when we were conventional, you'd have to spray it because there just wasn't enough there for, for year two. So unfortunately, nothing works every time. <laughs> right. Um, anybody else have any questions? Uh, I've got uh, just a, Amber says, uh, thanks. She says it's been super interesting to listen to everything you guys are doing. So, and I agree, it's always fun to find out what what you guys are actually might, doing. I thought I might just add one thing, uh, if I could. Um, mm -hmm. When you're monitoring your success with uh, with organic production, uh, keep in mind that it looks different. <laughs> if you're expecting that clean row on row uh, monocrop look um, it's not going to look like that and that's okay because you actually have the plants and the root system that's enhancing your soil and uh, I think we get confused with that that we need to learn how to measure success um, prime example one time we seeded peas into oats double and uh, it had been plowed down the year before and uh, the oats started and then we got a good rain and then the grasses started and when I swathed that crop of peas or whatever it looked like a hay field the neighbors thought it was actually hay and uh, there was 50 bushels of peas in there and two bales of really good feed along with it and still lots of ground cover so success is measured in a different form than the conventional livestock or conventional farming so you got to be mindful of that and and uh, you know if you want it to look like the perfect grain crop it might not but uh, anyways that's all i had to say on that and, and good luck with everyone and it's been interesting to be involved in this yeah, thanks, Ken. Any comments on that, Makai or Mark, on uh, how do you measure success? I would tend to agree with Ken. Uh, our, our monocultures are typically fairly clean because of our rotation, except if they're not clean, it's typically because of grass. It's not like we do have one field right now that's a bit of a problem with thistles, but it's going back into perennials and that'll take care of that. But um, it is an entire different mindset of management. You you manage, you have to manage differently. It's about prevention. You can't run around with a fire hose after you've lit the field on fire and trying to save it because you, you don't have the tools, the herbicide tools when you go into organics. So you have to plan year two, three years ahead 
of what you're going to do and recognize as you're doing that that things are going to change and it might not look exactly what you think it probably won't look exactly what you think it should so. but to see always pay attention and see what you can learn from the event anyway sure. yeah i would agree with that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of perception i get asked on a weekly basis especially in the summertime about so-called weeds which is basically anything in the field that people don't think it needs to be there and um, there's two two main things that I notice about that or three maybe um, if there's a weed there it's because it needs to be there's there's an issue with the soil and and uh, the weed is is fixing that um, I don't have weed issues in the in the sense that I think it affects um, my yield yeah they're visible but but it doesn't actually uh, it isn't a detriment um, and then the third thing I tell guys is instead of driving by that beautiful conventional field go take a walk in it and see how many weeds there are that you just can't see from the road because <laughs> that's that I've really noticed as well is, is um, it's it, it's a lot of its perception <clears throat> Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I see we are at uh, quarter after one now, so that's probably uh, where we should call it for today. Let you guys get back to uh, your regularly scheduled mayhem, as they say. Well, thank you all, Mark, Mackay, and Ken. That was really um, nice from you guys to share what you're doing and. Always something to learn for sure. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. For attending. Thank you.